my PhD supervisor, my, as they call it in German, Dr. Fata, has always uh, said, you know, Ara, if you want to do something meaningful and decent in the research, you have to work on intersection. You have to get into the area where different sciences, technologies, business areas, and so on and so forth get together, then you have a chance. So uh, having spent a couple of years and a reasonably successful technology career in the financial services, I ended up uh, as an independent consultant who is dedicating his professional life now to build bridges. I build bridges between technology and the banks. I build bridges between fintechs and um, uh, big corporations, incumbents. I, I, I hope I'll be able to build bridges between generations, uh, although I'm clearly belonging to the generation here on the <laughs> right, but I also try to help my home country, Armenia, in building bridges to, uh, to the rest of the world. Okay, um, let's get started. I love to start my presentation with this, with this comic. I always tend to use... Uh, uh, pictures to make my, try to make my message clear to, to the audience. Um, we all know these stories. We know the story of Nokia, we know the story of Kodak, we know the story of many other companies, Blackberry and so on and so forth, who uh, disappeared, right? From being successful businesses disappeared because of not willing or being able to change. Uh, the world is changing. Competition is changing, your clients are changing, your employees are changing, everything is changing, right? And often, frequently, your competition is coming from totally unexpected corner, right? If I, I've got to know that majority of the people here are representing financial services, as I was doing before, your competition is elsewhere, right? And People's expectation, the expectation of your clients and customers are driven by their experiences that they make elsewhere. People get impatient, they want to have very high quality of the service, they want to have per best and perfect customer experience and so on and so forth. Because of Amazons, Alibabas, Ubers, not talking about my today's Uber experience, which ended up in 10 canceled orders because of the chaos in Amsterdam. But generally, you order a car and in a couple of minutes you have a nice and decent car with the driver you don't want to talk to or want to talk to, whatever, right? So people's expectation and changing, and what is also changing is the reality around us, right? I still remember traveling to India where, where I was doing a lot of business with, with my uh, sourcing partners where the appendix to the job announcements was thicker than the newspaper itself. It was 64 pages of job announcements attached to the Times of Indian newspaper. Nobody will come to an idea to do that now, these days. Communication, video, encyclopedia, word processing, storage, I still keep couple of them in order to, to sell them someday as a, on an auction for, for a lot of money. Um, and the, the topic of eternal debate between myself and my wife, how should we protect our photos? I think they need to go there. She thinks that uh, we need to have this nicely bound books uh, 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 collecting dust on our shelf. Um, now, this whole change has brought to the fact that the totally different group of people, so-called digital natives, that are roughly, roughly, at the age of uh, 35 and below, uh, has emerged, right? And this group of people has some slightly different specific characteristics, right? They are much less contact, right? They, they, when they take, talk about personal meetings, they usually talk about video conference, they are much wet, more informed, they are much more uh, fact and purpose driven and so on and so forth. It's like I'm not judging, I'm just telling that there is some statistics around people being slightly different. And this group of people, right, the so-called uh, Gen Z, and meanwhile we are actually emerging into Gen Alpha, 
is currently between two and a half and three billion people. Hmm? Tendency going up for natural reasons. With the changing community, changing community of people, the economy is changing as well, right? We are landing in something which is called a fourth or fifth or sixth, you have different types of picture industrial revolution that describes where we are, and a huge pressure on, on, on margins and on economy and in companies. This guy said a famous statement at some point in time that in 10 years, in order to get 10,000 new customers, you will need to build a warehouse. It was in the context of Walmart. I would need to just add two servers. Today, it's probably going to be two clicks on any kind of cloud provider. It's going to take probably 10, 15 minutes. Um, Jeremy Rifkin, in his book about uh, zero marginal cost economy talks that additional cost of additional production of any goods is effectively zero. Having an additional subscriber on Netflix, zero cost. Publishing an additional digital book, zero cost. And you guys have to compete with them. So what? So you need to change as well. There are a couple of terms I'm going to do a little bit of basic education here as well. Sorry, bear with me. For some of you, it con it's going to be obvious, but some of you, probably not. There is also a little bit of fog dissolving that we have to do here. There are many, many terms that are being thrown around by people like me, uh, and generally about consultants. And uh, in order to get things right, I'll probably s uh, try to define a couple, and we go ahead. So automation. There is a scientific definition of what automation is. I, I tell you in a simple way, automation is replacing what a human was doing with a machine. So taking a part of human work, putting a machine in place. Not digital, it's a good thing, useful thing, not a digitalization, and by far not a digital transformation. Sorry, digitization even less. We have been talking about in the, bra in the break, this is, just taking a picture of an analog document, so forget it. Digital, digitalization, we're getting there, right? we're getting closer, and so it's effectively creating digital revenues, creating digital products, and so on and so forth, starting to create something that exists in the digital space. And the digital transformation is the last stage, right, where I want, if this thing works, ah, okay to define with you together. So digital transformation is a process of reinventing your business and operating model, right? With the use of modern technology. It's starting from scratch, killing everything you know, and starting from scratch, right? With massive impact on the ways of working. So it's not only changing what you do, it's also changing how you do it. So there are two pillars of digital transformation. It's my simplified men mental mirrors. I say there are things you do. This is about technology. And these are things how you do them. OK? Today I'm going to talk about AI. And I'm going to talk about innovation and partnership as a way to implement AI in the financial services industry. OK. Starting, uh, to do or not to do? This device is clearly driven by some AI. <laughs> okay, let's see if it goes to the next page. Okay, so the good and the bad news at the same time is that you are in troubles, right? No matter what you do, you're in troubles. As financial services executives, you are under a pressure of explainability of everything you do. Why did you come to this decision? You have to make, meet highest ethical standards and biases, avoid biases, but, right? So, so these two would probably drive you away from use of artificial intelligence as it is now. But at the same time, you are under pressure to deliver efficiency and, do the, and use the best tools to do informed decisions. So 
no matter what you do, you are in troubles. Or, no matter what you do, you've got an opportunity. So where is AI now? Right? The reality is that a single bug in AI subcomponent of a hyperscale called Alphabet caused swings in $100 billion in their market capitalization. It was declared there was a bug, they dropped 100 billion, they fixed it, it came back 80. Now, doctor versus chat GPT, I'm, gonna, no, I'm not gonna talk about much about chat GPT, but there are a couple of things I have to mention, right? Because I want to dissolve myths. So this is fact that people perceive this piece of technology more empathetic and prefer generally against a physician. At the same time, interesting, we talk about artificial intelligence. Intelligence, we are talking here about ChatGPT4, can pass all, almost all, common exams. Right? Especially my favorite, which is uniform bar exam, so they can become a lawyer. Okay. Does it help? Not really. At the same time, AI supported technologies offer less paid jobs to women who are searching for on the jobs, jobs on the internet, or favoring male candidates for specific jobs. This is two sides of the same coin. The fact is, it's here. The fact is that we are here to live with it. Now, when we talk about AI, there are a couple of bits of theory here. Uh, and I have to probably speed up. We generally speak about deep learning, which is part of machine learning, which is part of generally artificial intelligence. Okay, so this is how you should imagine this. Uh, iris, flowers, uh, exist. There are three, three commonly known uh, species of iris flowers that are described by different sizes of their uh, petals and sepals, so effectively the leaves. What do you think? What's the amount of data, training data, necessary for a machine learning algorithm to differentiate between these three types of spaces based on this? Any guess? Hundreds, thousands, millions, ten millions? No guess? Yeah, hundreds, 150. With 150 documents, because of the feature engineering, you converge to precision. And I'm going to use precision, knowing that it's not a correct term to define. AI accuracy of above 98%. Uh, Just throwing it into the basic random forest algorithm. Now, based on that, feature engineering, which was very well working on engineered or explained features of potential uh, object you want to analyze, didn't work for undefined cases, right? That's why we take a look at something which is called neurons, the cells that we have in our brain, uh, which are consisting of three important bits, and the body, the, uh, the, body, the um, dendrites, and the axons, so the transfer mechanism of the, uh, of the message of electrochemical impulses. And this, this transmission happens via this point of connectivity between neurons, which is called synapses, where the axon touches the dendrites of the next neuron cell. Now, engineers realized that there is a connectivity of this, of this nature and tried to imitate it by something which is called neural network. Right? They, these are supposed to be individual neurons, and these connectivities are the synapses that are being built. And what happened, and, and these and this artificial neurons are imitating the behavior of biological, biological neurons. What happened is that deep learning algorithms overcame right, the need of feature engineering. And it was possible because there was more data and more computational uh, cap capability available. So deep learning 
that's what is the basis of ChatGPT and DALI and everything is possible because of this. Okay? I hope you are putting it in your system of coordinates. Now, there is an interesting paradox, so-called Pugliani paradox, which we actually also overcame. So there was something that a philosopher, Pugliani, was saying that there is an implicit set of knowledge that humans have that cannot but that we cannot put in words and cannot explain. And the deep learning suddenly, surprisingly, overcame it. What's AI missing? A lot of things. So it's missing all these six things. I'll try to go one by one. AI doesn't have a clue of abstract concepts. It just has a shallow representation of an whether it's an image or it's a data set or whatever. AI, AI I'm sorry, deep learning, sorry, not AI. <laughs> deep learning needs huge amount of data to learn. There is no social learning yet. There are attempts to teach one the, uh, data, uh, an, a deep learning algorithm to teach another. Um, they're not generally good in one trial learning, right? Um, there are people, we human beings, having done one thing once, there are very, very, very many examples of having done one thing once, we can repeat. There is no chance of systematicity. systematicity. So the most famous example um, of AI, AlphaGo, AlphaZero, was taught on 20 by 20 Go board. And uh, by the changing the board size to 16 by 16, you just effectively need to start from scratch. Nothing works. Whereas in our case would be more or less same and similar logic. And they can't put the different pieces of like knowledge, abstract knowledge together. So now I'm going to jump through several slides because I've said everything what I meant in quick version. So how are humans achieving this? We're coming with some pre-programmed knowledge. We have the knowledge of objects, we have the sense of um, face perception, predefined face perception algorithms, we have sense of numbers and so on and so forth. So we are born pre-programmed. Probably you know this picture. What is darker, A or B? Any guesses? Exactly, you knew it. They are exactly the same. Why we think they're not the same? Because we think, we know the concept of cylinder, we know the concept of shadow, and because we are hallucinating. We are constantly hallucinating. We are combining our programmed knowledge with what we see through our sensors. Eyes, hands, thermal sensor, whatever. And we create so-called best guess of what it is. And that's why a machine learning algorithm, the classical deep learning neural network, can only process, by the fact of being only being able to process the one signal, cannot overcome this simple thing, which for us is a no-brainer, and this thing as well. <laughs> like it's hard to imagine people who cannot differentiate between a chihuahua and the blueberry muffin. One more bit of information for you, Moravec's, or Moravec's paradox, depending on where you come from. Evolution has passed over millions, a huge amount of training to us. And the fact that today's technology robots are easily doing very complex things that we struggle with, like multiplying huge numbers, but cannot move a couple. 
Like, so there's a huge amount of programming you needed to move this out. And for us, it's no-brainer to do this. Is because of the fact that we are coming with the hundreds of millions or several millions of years of training information, learning. And we still know very little about, about, about a bra our brain, about the conscious, consciousness, about imagination. There's a new, wonderful, beautiful theory of thousand brains. Is it true? We don't know. What artificial intelligence can do, though, it's a super prediction machine. It can very well predict things, right? If they are in predefined, confined context. And there is a crazy definition of all the kind of parameters that you usually get out when you describe the accuracy of a prediction machine. Right? We've heard about some of the true positives and true false negatives in the context of last two years, right? With our COVID antigen tests being a prediction machine for something else. Now, what is GPT? GPT is a large language model. It's a deep learning based large language model. Its initial versions was, were trained on much less parameters. They're more sophisticated version. They do not disclose, but apparently it's a hundreds of trillion parameters. And already problems are coming in. They're using data to train where the data owners are claiming that it's their own data. They have issues with the regulation already, right? Copyright is a topic and so on and so forth. There are alternatives to that. And, and also, by the way, some countries don't allow them to us to use them, right? There are alternatives like BART and Bing from uh, Microsoft. Uh, that are out there that are even not even accessible at all in Europe, I believe. But the interesting bit about this is that they are surprisingly convincing and factually wrong. Very often. Try to ask very specific questions and you will get bullshit, sorry, back. While the image processing things can do stunning messages, uh, build pictures of myself, right? I wish I could do this or that. Uh, they're still struggling with creation of this. Look at the hand of this beautiful woman. It's completely just like coming from a horror movie. Why? There is not enough training data on hands. Right? And the hand is generally a much more flexible and difficult object to, to show. Whereas faces, we all have two eyes, one nose, and so on and so forth. It's relatively static. But with all the bad news, there is also good news. Something which is human and machine partnership is emerging and is showing that a group of radi radiologists analyzing um, pictures, um, computer tomography pictures of patients with suspected pneumonia combined, right, with a piece of technology that was helping them, came up with something. The green one is the software, the orange one is the radiologist, and the blue one is the combination of them. Much better result. So what I'm trying to say here, hybrid human machine intelligence is the powerful tool to use the technology at this point in time. Last words on AI, more data bits, better models. That's what we learned, AI mean deep learning, but better data beats more data. You have been talking about that in the morning. And you should be thinking about the process, entire process, not a module of uh, artificial intelligence. Now, how? So this was about what? Now let's talk about how. So yeah, now you are all excited. You think you want to do AI implementation in your organization, and this is how you're going to do. Uh, problem. Skills, talent, customers, they are very, very scarce. Right? Very hard to get hold of not available, very expensive, and partnership is the answer. We were talking about that in the break. 
There is, it's hard to argue that Google, Amazon, uh, um, Apple, and so on and so forth are very, very successful and competent in terms of engineering companies. But look at the ecosystem of partnerships they have in order to become best in what they do. They don't do everything themselves. Some are even investing, some are partnering, some are even investing, depending on your appetite and the organization that you represent. And partnership is not usually, especially with a startup, it's not something that you put your through your procurement process. It's something that is needs to be relied on trust, not a mutual and common goals, and the clarity of the purpose. So Cognize, the company that I am here on behalf of, uh, is an AI company. It was an AI company before ChatGPT and DALI. This company exists for more than four years now. Has a few hundred people distributed all over the world. Uh, in the United States, Europe, in uh, China, in uh, Costa Rica, apparently Portugal, and in Armenia. Um, what they do, they are extracting insights from unstructured documents, photos, PDFs, and everything that our common all organization managed to kill in terms of data over the past 20, 30 years. Clever people from this organization say clever things. To scale AI, you need to be channeled and create reusable assets, platforms, and repeatable processes. How do you do that if it's an experiment in your lab? Best case. You do that with the help of partners, partners like Cognize or others, where you start to attack problems like this, right? In order to have sufficient accuracy, sufficient quality of your models, you need a lot of data, as I said. Normally, you don't have it, right? And the marginal cost of getting additional data is linear, right? So it blows up any reasonable use case. Data partnership is also an aspect. So a partnership with an AI company that is focused on it gives you an advantage to make use of the amounts of data through synthetic data, through the proper data governance, cross-learning, and so on and so forth. It gives you opportunity to do the models and technology stack and the renewal of the tools at the speed that you in incumbent organizations cannot afford. And creates new possibilities through features, carefully designed features. Based on, I just want to draw your attention on the second one, or something that I said, hybrid intelligence, a partnership of a software and a human. But the fact that you will be sitting and owning all your data yourself, something that you would naturally worry being in a financial services business. Now, how do they do it? The four pillars of Cognize, to some extent with, with my support and advice, are continuously improving processes and basic set of foundation models that they come, pre canned models, finance domain specific. Yeah. You see that in the area of deep learning that models are perf performing much better if they are finance, mo uh, uh, business area specific, and the hybrid intelligence. In, in the platform we provide, the learning process and the execution process are not disconnected. They are all in common, right? You do not train and then execute, but you train and execute in one process. So everything you correct automatically flows into the training set of data. There are set of pre-trained pre models for you, table detection, page structure detection, and so on and so forth, right? That give you an additional boost in performance. Language specific, right? Think of the word principle. Principle in finance is something different than principle in the school, right? It's a guy or a girl who runs the school versus my trader colleague <laughs> um, of principle of a bond or whatever. 
right? And it's coming in a combined and nicely slick user interface where you can capture your training data. Now, the most of AI is coming, as I said, as a result of human and machine interaction. Easily manageable, secure and scalable, where you worry about the tip, how you integrate it into, into your process, and the rest, data scientists, subject matter experts, model develop, designers, training data, and so forth, and it's coming for you. You retain the intellectual property. It's not being exported, taken away. You have privacy. Your data is never, ever shared with anyone, and you have the full audit trail of which, which data is being used. And it gives you an opportunity for a two-thirds of cost reduction in terms of the process, this was a business case calculated on a process, on an example of financial report processing. So, AI to do is clearly the answer. A couple of things to finish my presentation. Importance of data is coming back. It's not anymore the models, but the data. There are very few companies. Not everyone takes care about your privacy and your concerns. Handling technology and artificial intelligence is a key skill for going, and not being able to build, but handling it is a key skill for your, for your business. Um, hy hybrid intelligence is the answer, as I said, and partnership with companies, innovative companies that come up with their solutions is going to help. As they say, it was just a court at the time. I think we are at this point with regards to artificial intelligence, specifically deep learning. Thank you very much.